My message, Iron Chariots, the prophetic message the Lord gave me about what I believe God wants to do. And the Lord was with Judah, and he drave, drave out the inhabitants of the mountain, but could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. Isn't it amazing? They could drive out the mountain people, but they couldn't drive out the valley people because they had iron chariots. I want you to turn also to Joshua. Turn left to Joshua 17. Joshua 17. And uh, let's, uh, let's read just one verse there also. Verse 18. Do you have it? Joshua 17, verse 18. By the way, how many of you love the Word? Do you love the Word of God? Do you tremble at it? Okay, we're going to see it tonight very clearly. 17th chapter of Joshua, 18th verse. But the mountain shall be thine, for it is a wood, that means a forest, and thou shalt cut it down, and the outgoings, or the borders of it, shall be thine, for thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. God says, don't look at those iron chariots. doesn't matter how strong or how mean they look. Drive them out. You've got the power. And then I just read you, the Lord was with Judah. He drove out the inhabitants of the mountain, but he could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that your Spirit would come upon me tonight, that I could minister your Word with the unction, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, that we would hear a sound from heaven. We pray, dear Lord, that you would strike our hearts with a knife of conviction. Lord, bring forth the burden that you put in my heart. It's there, Lord. Bring it out. Bring it out among us, Lord, that we may see it, we may hear it. Oh, God, speak loud and clear, because we believe you're about to do something. We hear the sound of rain, but it will not come until we seek your face. Lord, convict us, touch us, do something in me tonight as I preach. And every hear of the word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think that America is being plagued with AIDS? Of all the nations in the world, why, is, why this great civilized nation with, in New York City now, an estimated 10,000 victims of AIDS and spreading? Why are our streets unsafe to walk in? Why don't our children play on the streets like they do in Poland? When we're in Poland, you go to a grocery store and all the baby carriages are lined up. Nobody touches them. The children are playing on the streets under communism. And yet here in our country, they can't. Our cities, our streets are not safe. Why, why are our borders defenseless? We have drug pushers coming in from Colombia. We have them coming in from Hong Kong. We have them coming in from Canada. Every one of our borders are defenseless. They're bringing in tons and tons of narcotics like a tidal wave. And our government can't do anything about it. Why, why is it that all these things are happening to us? And I'll tell you what, I want you to turn to Isaiah. And, and in Isaiah, uh, the first chapter, you have a picture of what the United States is becoming. A nation of slaves. Isaiah, the first chapter. And uh, if you want to, if you don't know where that is, fellas, and by the way, did you hear all this shouting and clapping for the Lord? We've got Teen Challenge guys up here, safe from drugs and alcohol. They've got a right to shout and praise the Lord. Amen. That's my, that's my amen corner. My, my amen corner right down here. Okay. Uh, look at chapter 1, verse 4 to 7. All sinful nation of people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They provoke the Holy One of Israel with anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken anymore? Why will you revolt, revolt more and more? The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises, putrefying sores. They've not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified. That means softened with ointment. And this is a picture, a cage of unclean birds. And, and don't turn there, but Deuteronomy 28, 68, God warned Israel that because of their wickedness, they'd be sold as slaves. They'd become a nation of slaves. The Lord shall bring you into Egypt, and there you shall be sold as slaves to your enemies. You'll be sold as slaves. Because that thing that's in your heart, that lust, that wickedness, is going to drive you to slave. I'll turn you over to it. In America, the United States of America has become an evil, wicked nation sold to slavery. We are a nation of slaves. We're slaves now to lust, to alcohol, to drugs, television, money, sex, pleasure, you name it. We have become a nation of slaves. Now, I love America. I've heard people say you preach too much doom and gloom, Brother Dave. 
You don't, you're not patriotic. No, the patriotic man that loves his nation holds up their sins so there'll be repentance. We've been warned to study God's Word and learn from the examples of Israel because their wickedness is a type of what we see today and how God judged Israel is how He's going to judge again because our God doesn't change. If He's going to deal with sin in the Old Testament, we have the same principles, we have the same setup, He's going to deal just as severely with us. Now, all these things happen to them, to the Israelites, for examples. And they are, for, they are written for our instructions upon whom the ends of the world have come. In other words, go into the Old Testament. See what happened when they sinned. See what happened when they became slaves. And you can know without being a prophet. You don't need some new revelation. Look at the Bible principles and you learn from their instructions. And probably one of the most powerful, detailed instructions of what God wants to do in New York City is found in the first few chapters of Judges, 4th and 5th chapter. I want you to turn to Judges 4, and I want you to uh, read with me the first two verses. Judges 4, verses 1 and 2. And the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord when Uhud was dead. Now look at me for just a minute. Uhud was the prophet of God who cleansed the land, took a stand for righteousness, that had 80 years of peace. 80 years of peace. And now, the children of Israel, the prophet's dead. And God's word says the children of God are always bent on backsliding. Now look me right in the eye. You may not know that, but we're all bent on backsliding. That's why God has to raise up voices that provoke us to righteousness. Because there's something in our nature that when we don't hear the sound of thunder, when the word isn't coming at us, we have a tendency to gravitate to our sins. And God has to keep the pressure on. That's why you should, you should rejoice if you go to a church where the pressure is kept on you. Where there's constant reproof. Thank God for that. There's going to be constant Holy Ghost reproof in this church. Provoke your righteousness. My granddad was right. Make him mad or glad, but nothing in between. Verse 2. The Lord... They did evil in the sight of the Lord when you was dead. The prophets gone. They began to play around with sin. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazar. The captain who was host was Sisera, which dwelled in Hereseth of the Gentiles. All right, now, now, now look at this, please. Here's a once holy nation, an example of the righteousness of God. And they were relying only on the power of the Lord at one time. They were afraid of nothing. Th their cities were so powerful, the fear of the Israelites was upon all the nations around them when they walked in holiness. Nobody could stand up to them. No one dared raise a hand. No one dared raise a hand against Solomon all these years until he sinned. And then enemy after enemy was raised up against Solomon. No one could touch David until he sinned. Israel has sinned, being sold now into slavery. And now they become cowardly. They become craven. They become weak before their enemies. They're sold into slavery because of their lust and compromise. And for 20 years now, Israel has been in bondage to Jabin and the Canaanites. And the way they were held in captivity was 900 iron chariots. And look at verse 3. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, for he had, for he had 900 chariots of iron. In 20 years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. And the Bible goes on to say, if, if you turn to chapter 5, you'll get a picture in, in the song that Deborah sang after the victory. You'll get a picture here now of what the conditions were like. There was war in the gates. Look at verse 6. The highways were unoccupied. Travelers walked through the byways. They wouldn't take the main roads because they weren't safe. Now look at me, please. Get the picture. The children were living in fear. People were not uh, uh, walking the streets or the highways because of the rumbling of the chariots. These 900 awesome chariots, armored cars, it would be like 900 tanks roaming down Times Square. 900 of them. Think of it. This way it was in Budapest when the Russians came in with their mighty tanks and crossed the, the rebellion in Hungary, especially in Budapest. The people lived in fear. And within a week, they crushed that great rebellion of the Hungarians. Same thing in Czechoslovakia. And you see, they, they looked at these and they trembled. 
There was a time that an Israelite who walked in holiness would see it as a pile of junk. Nothing but straw before the wind of God. But now, because of sin, they are cowards and they run cravenly to hide in their homes. And Israel, the Bible said, fled the villages. They begin to hide in the hills. They had become a groveling, powerless people. Why? Because of sin. They did evil in the sight of God. Now, you say, what's your point, Brother Dave? Are you going to suggest that, that uh, we're like that now, that the church is in this condition groveling before the enemy? Don't you know, uh, people will say to me that we're having great conventions. We've never had as many seminars. We've never had more people calling for prayer conferences than we have right now. What about all the Jesus marches and all the, 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 the Jesus balloons that they're, they're flying up in the sky and the aprons that say, turn to Jesus or Jesus loves you? I'm not making fun of that, but they say, look at all the religious activity. You can't tell me that we're not in some kind of revival. What about all the mega churches? Five, six thousand people coming, raising their hands and praising God. Are you going to put that down? Aren't you excited about what God's doing? What about all the Christian ministries now that are springing up? All the ranches and, and all the jail ministries and all the parachurch ministries. Everywhere you turn, there's a new ministry springing up. Aren't you rejoicing in that? What about all the mass literature distribution? Everywhere you go now, people are passing out literature talking about Jesus. Isn't this revival? Isn't God with His church? Are you, what's your point in all of this? Are you, are you saying that that we are afraid uh, of something and we're not accomplishing what God has called us to accomplish? The answer to it is right outside the door of this building. The answer to that is right here in Times Square and 42nd Street. You don't have to go very far to find out that we're not in the kind of revival God wants to bring. Not at all. We're talking about chariots now. We're talking about iron chariots of the devil. There's wicked chariots that roam up and down these streets unchallenged. Every American city with drug pushers. Our kids are being damned to hell because these chariots, these iron chariots, are not being challenged by the church. I'm standing here tonight in town hall, and you can put all the churches in New York City together, and you run more than a powder puff. And not more than a powder puff as far as the devil's concerned. Last week we brought in about 500 Christians from around the country, and many, many of them got the burden for New York City. They went out there with boldness and faith, and they have a burden of the Lord, they went home to weep. But I know a great number, and I heard them and overheard them, they said, I can't wait to get home. That's a slime pit. Demons are loose out there. And they were so anxious to get back to their safe little uh, haven of rest. But New Yorkers, many Christian New Yorkers are the same way. They don't want to go down to Slime Square anymore. They ignore it. They don't want to hear the news anymore. They see so many bad women, they just pass without even looking anymore. They see so many beggars, they're hardened to it. And it's almost as if I've drawn a line here. We give the devil Times Square. We give the devil 42nd Street. We give him the drug territory. We give him these territories. And we let him go completely unchallenged. How dare we boast that there's an awakening in America, anywhere in the United States, when Satan's strongholds are not being challenged by the church? What do you think the attitude is out there on the street about the church? What do you think? You, you go out there and ask the people. Some of them walked in here tonight. And by the way, there were some alcoholics who walked here tonight while they're singing. They, they singing. You know, we got Christians going to get upset about it. I'm going to tell you, there's going to be a lot of alcoholics, drug addicts coming in here, singing, even raising their hands in mockery, and the Holy Ghost will get a hold of them and save them before the meeting's over. So don't, don't, don't uh, sit there and judge it all. God doesn't want you to judge it. But what do you think the man out in the street thinks about it? The church? What? Well, that's, those are those people down there with the megaphone uh, saying, hey, you're going to hell. Get right with God. Those are those people that interrupt you when you're walking down the street and stick something in your, in, in, in your hand, a piece of literature. It's those old ladies that go to church. All the little old ladies. It's a bunch of people that gather together just to sing and shout and talk in tongues. Doesn't mean anything out there. 
Doesn't mean a thing. Nothing changes here. They don't have any power. They don't have any spiritual authority. And tonight, there are a few hundred Christians there in all of New York City. I don't think there'd be more than two, three thousand Christians gathering tonight. Maybe more up in Harlem. I don't know. There, there, there may be some, but Sunday night you can't get a handful. I'll tell you where they're at. They're out laughing with Bill Cosby right now on television. Sitting right in front of a television set, letting the city go to hell, letting the devil's iron church go where they please. You've got no right to call yourself a Christian. You've got no right to say you're going to pray until you can say, I will not sit still and let this happen anymore. I want to challenge the devil. We've got people lounging on their beds of ease. They want to go to church and hear some soft organ music. They sleep half the way through. And they go to church just because they believe God expects it. And, and, they're, and they're convicted if they don't go at least once a week. I'll tell you what, if you come here, you're not even going to be considered a righteous person. Not by us. We won't judge you. But the Holy Ghost won't even consider you righteous until you get so hungry to get there you can't wait. And, and please don't work it. The truth is, the church has settled for the mountaintops and left the valleys to the devil. Like the Israelites in this story. Look at uh, the, the, that scripture again. Go back to Judges 1. Look at 19. And the Lord was with Judah. Now look at that. How, how can God be with the people and they're powerless? How can, God, how can it be said, and God was with Judah? Well, look what they did. They, they took the mountaintops. Hey, you know what the mountaintop represents? That rep represents the inner battles, the inner struggle against lust. That's the battle you have in your own home. It's the battle with the flesh. And you win that victory. And that's what most people consider the church. That's a place to go to get victory of your habits. That's a place to go when you need healing. That's a place to go only when you've got some secret battle raging in you. You go to get straightened out. No, folks, that's not all. That's it, but that's only half the story. There's much, much more to it than that. Now, thank God for the victories on the mountaintops. But you see, when Israel refused to go against those chariots, they created a false image in the eyes of the heathen about God's character. You know what those chariot drivers said? Why, well, he's a God of the hills. That's all. Those people up there have looked down on us and they're powerless. Look at them up there singing and shouting. Building their altars up on that mountain. They don't dare come down here. They would dare to come down. He's the God of the hills. Weak, powerless. And folks, that's exactly what's happened. We have relinquished certain sections of society, certain places of our city, certain levels, and we've just written it off. That's, he's the God of the world, and that belongs to him. Our God has his territory. The devil has his territory. We'll walk in the mountaintop and we'll let the valleys to the devil. That's the way it is right now. This, this image of a sick, weak church. There can be no revival until God's people go out by faith to challenge every inch the devil is taking. And I believe that. And I'm not preaching hype. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a cheerleader. I'm, I'm believing what I'm preaching tonight. God's taken a long time to get me to the place where I'm preaching the message I'm preaching tonight. It's taken a long time. Out there, the image is Christianity, the church, money-grabbing television evangelist. Old women! Occasionally, someone will see a converted drug addict. They'll, they'll hear testimony. And occasionally, something will drift into their subconscious mind that the church is doing a little bit. But there's not a person around here believes that this church or any other church has any power with God. And I'll tell you what, when the revival comes that God wants to send, nobody can ignore what God is doing. Nobody can ignore it, especially the devil and all of his iron chariots. And so, now, we, we're the man on the street, all he can judge is by PTL. And all the rich preachers up in Harlem driving their Rolls Royces. 
There's a black preacher up there, Rolls Royce. He's got 15 Rolls Royces, and he, he has a couple of black boys out there signing them for him. In, in other words, that's what God does for you. He gives you a Cadillac, gives you a Rolls Royce. That's garbage. Fellas, that's not the gospel. Gospel, Jesus didn't say, save you to make you rich. He said he'll make you a witness and give you power to go out and drive away all the power of the devil and be a conqueror for Jesus' sake. Hallelujah. I tell you, when the revival that God wants to send comes, no demon on earth is safe. There's not an inch that is written off. There is no coexistence with evil. There's not a principality or a power of hell that is immune to the moving and the work of the Holy Spirit. None. In the Welsh revival, years and years ago, a young man by the name of Evan Roberts, just a young preacher, a young man, he got about 15, 20 teenagers together and he began to fast and pray. Lord, we're tired of our alcoholic fathers beating our mothers. We're tired of our little baby brothers and sisters going without food, without shoes. And they had a burden for their families. And they began to pray because the Welsh miners, they'd come right out of the mine, go right to the bars and wells and become a drunken nation. And Evan Roberts and these teenagers began to pray. And after six weeks of prayer, the Spirit of the Lord began to come down. A miner was walking by the way to the bar. He wasn't even in the church. Something drew him in. He got right to the door, ran to the altar, and fell in his face and called on the name of the Lord. Nobody was preaching. The Spirit of God was moving. He went out and told another man, and soon it was spreading. And I want to tell you, folks, within a year, revival was sweeping all over Wales. And within a year and a half, most of the bars in Wales were shut down because the bartenders were getting converted. They had to have, the police officers... We're, we're forming quartets to sing in the revival meeting because there was no more crime. If you wanted music, you called the police precinct. I serve the same God. And those young people serve notice on the devil and every bartender and everybody else. We serve a God that can shut you down. We serve a God that has power. They weren't afraid of the devil's iron church. You say you're yelling. Yeah, I guess I am. But the revival that God wants to send, I'll tell you what happens. The idol makers begin to cry out, our very livelihood is at stake. The jailers fall on their face and say, what must I do to be saved? The magistrates begin to tremble. And the cities are filled with the knowledge of God. And everybody knows God's at work. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I'm just getting started. There's only one way to bring about the revival God wants to send to New York City. And, and you'll find it right here in the second verse, chapter 4 again. And the Lord sold them into the hands... Or look, look at verse 3. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Is that what it says in your Bible? The children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Now, in the original Hebrew, it's stronger than that. In the original Hebrew, it says, and they gathered together in one accord and began to shriek at God. Shriek. You know what that means? At the top of their lungs. They were so desperate, so tired of the slavery, so tired of hearing those iron chariots rumbling down, sending fear in their families, so tired of it, being under the thumb of the devil. The Bible says they began to shriek together unto God. It wasn't privately. They were corporately gathering together. They began to intercede, shrieking out to God. Oh, well, where is that kind of desperation now? What kind of, you know, someone said, I heard it the other day, A.B. Simpson, the great preacher, used to preach in New York City. Great uh, man of God. And someone was going by his office early in the morning, about 7 o'clock, and the door was open, and they saw A.B. Simpson on the floor, and he had his arms around a globe of the earth, and he was weeping tears all over the globe. And he was calling out, Oh, God, must they all be damned? Where, where is that kind of burden of the Lord? The church has lost it. No, we want to go and learn how to be a success, how to be prosperous. 
So I'm telling you right now, here's one preacher who believes that that's a doctrine of demons. And I'm not afraid to tell the whole city. Doesn't mean that everybody's preaching it is, is, is demon possessed. It's just that they're blind. And one day, if they start seeking the face of God with all their heart, they'll drop it like a hot potato and start preaching the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That burden of the Lord. But I'll tell you something. In the midst of all this apostasy, God had a praying body. He had a Deborah company. There was a prophetess by the name of Deborah. Oh, hallelujah. God always has somebody. I'll tell you what, if the men go to sleep, God will raise up a woman. And I'll tell you what, with all these big shot TV evangelists going away, they're God going to have to raise up a woman before it's all over. He's doing that right now. And, and, you see, there was a place called Ephraim. Now, they were hiding out. You weren't safe anywhere else. So she went to the hills. She went outside the camp, so to speak. Ephraim means double fruit. Well, everybody, everything around her is dry and barren, and people are not bearing fruit. Up on a hill, there's a woman in touch with God, getting to know the heart of God, hearing from God on her face before the Lord, prophesying. She's all by herself under a palm tree on Mount Ephraim. It's overlooking the Valley of Achor. And in the Valley of Achor, there's a door of hope. That door of hope is at the palm tree up on top of the mountain of double fruit. Much fruit. And you know God's going to have a people going to bear much fruit in these last days. And I don't know how it must have started as a little trickle at first, but somebody found out, hey, there's a place where there's a clear word coming. There's a place where your soul set on fire. There's a woman that's preaching something I've never heard. It makes my heart burn. There's a word coming forth. Where is it? It's a woman. Her name is Deborah. She's, you've got to go way up this path. You, man, you've got to climb and climb, but way up there, it's under a palm tree. It's nothing fancy. But boy, did she know God. And there was a trickle at first. And then soon they came from everywhere because a fire was burning. God was answering the prayers of His people. And God was stirring hearts. And I'll tell you what, when people begin to pray, He brings forth shepherds after His own heart. You go to a dead church. You do one of the things, either get out or get a group of people around you and fast and pray till the, fire, the preacher either gets fired up or gets out. Ship him out on your knees. Get on your knees and ship him out. I say that lovingly. Because your children are at stake. The teenagers are going to hell if you sit under a shepherd that's not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But look at the people that come here. I looked at this, it's amazing. Uh, chapter 5, look at chapter 5 there. The, the upper class, the rich people came, riding on their white horses. Uh, you, you can see that at uh, verse 10, chapter 5, verse 10. Speak, ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment. Look, they were riding, coming in their white steeds. In fact, uh, Josephus said, or, or rather, uh, one of the writers said, that they covered them with their beautiful rugs or saddles, these fancy saddles. And they were making their way up to here, Deborah. Think of it now. Uh, we've got, you know, when I first came to New York City, uh, I thought, there are no people here of the upper class, there are no people in New York that have a burden for the lost. And the first people I met that, that had the greatest burden I ever saw was Walter Hoving who had the greatest shares of Tiffany. He, he was major stockholder of Tiffany's. And you know how, you know where most of our support came when we started? From Walter Hoving and his friends. Walter Hoving got a hold of, of uh, some very wealthy friends, and I had to borrow a quarter to get to the meeting, but it was at the United Nations building. And I'm, I was 115 pounds then. Lord just called me out of the country. I, I, didn't, even, I didn't even know a rich person. I didn't know that God could move in the upper class. And I had to borrow a quarter. The subway was a quarter at the time. I had to borrow a quarter to get there. And I went into the United Nations. Mrs. Norman Vincent Pill was, was hosting it. And there was Mrs. Hoving and all her wealthy friends. And I, I, I looked at them very suspiciously. And one of the dear ladies, she said, My dear, are you going to tell us something about the need, please? And I watched as I told about the need and watched them weeping and crying. I remember going to Walter Hoving's home one time 
for lunch. And on the way, on the subway, all of, all of these appeals. I mean, one appeal after another for money. And when I got there, I was, I just sat down, I was just about to say, or I told him, I said, you know, I came up here and I saw all those subway appeals and I was about to say, isn't that awful? Everybody got their hand out for money. And before I could say it, I'm so glad I didn't say it because he said, isn't it wonderful to live in a country where people can present their needs like that and we can respond? I wanted to crawl under the table. Those wealthy people knew more of God than I did. They were, they were so open to the Lord. And these iron white horses came to you, Deborah, and they heard about those iron traps and that they should not be under bondage and their hearts began to bleed. And in this revival... The end of sad one. Just like in Finney's Day, Finney's Great Revival, some of the wealthiest people in New York were there. Their money didn't mean anything to them. They had a heart after God. Since we've been in New York, we've got telephone calls, two in particular. Brother Dave, don't forget the wealthy class. They need Jesus just like everybody else. They came to hear Deborah. Then you've got the middle class, those who walk, it says. These are the subway crowd, like you and me. Buses, subway, they walked. They didn't come on white horses. They labored. They lived from day to day, paycheck to paycheck. But down the hall, sitting down with the rich, nobody in preference because at Deborah's prayer meeting, nobody could sign but God. And then, of course, you've got the middle class, those who walked in, you've got the poor. Verse 11, those that are delivered from the noise of the archer in the places of drawing water. I mean, these people had arrows shooting at them all the time. They, they lived from moment to moment. They had to draw water. They lived from one draw to another. And the Bible said they came. And the scribes came. Look at 5.14. Out of Zebulun, they that handled the pen of the writer. Look at me. They that handled the pen of the writer. There were writers, professional people coming up to hear Deborah. And she was saying something's about to happen in the land. Get ready. And I'll tell you, I, I bleed this love my heart and listen. There, are, there is a hidden body of scribes in New York City, mighty with the pen, and other professionals in the media. And this represents the media. This represents these that are hidden away. Many have been praying and seeking God. And in this revival, God is going to release them with Holy Ghost energy and power. And that pen is going to become a piercing knife. In every revival, there's been the same thing. God has always used the scribe. And we're going to see it again. I've already met a few of them. <clears throat> I believe there are probably one or two of them here tonight. And, and by the way, this, this great move of God was not a macho thing. When God begins to move, no macho business. All you Spanish guys hear me? No macho man. Not in a revival. Both Deborah and Barak. And by the way, she came to Barak and she said, Now you can go alone, but if you insist that I go, you won't get the glory. God will give the glory to a woman. And, and she'll get the credit. But Barak, he was of a different nature than some of the ministries today. He didn't care about getting the glory. He, he wanted that, that divine guidance with him. He wanted that spiritual authority with him. He wanted that praying woman at his side. I don't care about the glory. And when the revival comes, there's no ego tripping. There's no flesh anywhere. You can't smell flesh. You believe that? Glory be to God. Boy, I'll tell you what, see, when the revival comes that God wants to bring, oh, you'll hear, you, you don't hear, oh, you come hear my favorite teacher. Now, you don't hear, say, boy, does he have power. No, you're going to hear, Jesus is there. The Holy Spirit is at work there. There's a holiness there. God is speaking there. That's what you hear. You don't hear the sound of a man's name. Now, the victory against these iron chariots was really... One on Mount Ephraim under that palm tree. And, and it, uh, by the way, Barak's name means lightning. And, and, and Deborah, this, this, this praying clan, this praying people of Deborah needed the lightning movements and action of Barak. And, and it's that willingness to strike when God says move. And move when God says move. Because out of this intercession came the clearest direction you could ever see in the Bible. How clear it is. Look at verse 6, chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 6. Look at this. You ever wondered about, does God really direct us today? 
Can we get clear guidance? All right, look at it. It can't be any clear. Go to Mount Tabor. Gather 10,000 men. And the enemy's going to come up you with iron chariots at Kishon River. And God's going to deliver those iron chariots and the whole army into your hands. And God's going to go before you. And in fact, Deborah was walking so close to God, she'd been so on her knees, so in intercession, she knew the very day that God wanted to move. She knew the when and the how and the why. Because she had been on her face and God was speaking to her heart. Why is it that so much that we do today for the Lord is, is wrapped in confusion? Why is so much Christian activity so powerless? Why is, why is there so little to show for so much activity? You know that since we came here in 1958, Teen Challenge, we have dumped, in World Challenge, we have dumped tons and tons of literature on New York City. I mean, I, I, can, I can show you pictures way back in 1958 and 59, 1959 and 60, where we had a newspaper about the coming of the Lord. It was called the Rapture Journal. And we've got a picture of, of tons of it there. The pastors stand behind it. We're praying over it. I, I look back at all the things I've tried to reach New York. I, I've tried every gimmick there is. I found out, you know, a number of years ago that Billy, or that Oral Roberts had a great big cathedral cruiser. It was a huge bus that was built for the cost of $250,000 by General Motors. And I found out it was in Mexico, and, I, and the sides opened up like a clam. It looked like it was from Mars. It was an incredible machine. I thought, boy, that'll draw a crowd. I'll just pull it right down the slums and open it up, and the choir will be there with musicians, and I'll preach on that stage. I've got to do something to get the crowd. They didn't tell me it took 10 gallons to move it a mile. <laughs> that big monster rolled up. I remember it was down here by the, by the pier, over here around 42nd Street, in the pier. And I drove up and I smoked me. I walked around that and already a crowd was going to see the crowd's there already. And, and I thought it was very, very ironic, significant that my first meeting with that bus would be in front of a church where Finney had a revival. So I pulled it in front of Finney's old church, or at least where he said and preached down in Brooklyn, and we wound that thing up. Don, were you there that first night? I mean, we got a crowd opened up, lights were on, the loudspeaker blaring, the music was on, and suddenly a crowd gathered around and looked and looked and looked and walked away. <laughs> we wound up with two people. Never used it again. Used it one night. Fortunately, we sold it to somebody up in the Yonkers uh, who, who charged 50 cents to tour through it. Then I thought, well, if that doesn't work, I'll, I'll make some of these desk, uh, street desks with microphones and flags, and I designed everything. There's not a thing that a preacher's tried that I haven't tried. And, and why is it that so much that we do is not having effect? Why is the devil still laughing? Why are the iron chariots just go prancing on their way, not even moving it? Because we're standing out there with paper swords. And I'll tell you what, that's all it is. I, I, I thank God nobody's believed in literature more than I have. But I've come to a place now where I believe that not one piece of literature should go out. And, because you can't stand in front of a tank holding a piece of paper and say, Stop in the name of the Lord. You've got this little paper sword in your hand. Not unless it's backed up by the Holy Ghost in intercessory prayer. And then God turns into rapier and steel that nothing can stop. And passing literature promiscuously, it's going to wind up in the garbage heap. Why is it that all of the activities now, legless and confused, and they don't satisfy, the heart is not satisfied, because we have not spent time, as Deborah did, under the palm tree on the mountain alone, seeking the face of God, hearing from God, knowing where to go, when to go, and how to go. And I believe if we had a praying people, if we had young men really get the burden of the Lord, they could get on their face. God could tell them the very block to go where there's a people that are prepared. I'm sick and tired of just going out on a street corner and setting up. I want to know that when I go there, there have been a praying people and I've been on my face and there's a spiritual authority that no drug guy can stand up against, no alcoholic, no drug pusher. They'll either run or repent. You know, if you live in New York City, it's going to take more than we've had. It's going to take a lot more. It's going to, it's going to cost something.
Now, they, 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 what they really did here, by the way, you know they prayed down a rainstorm? That's how they got the victory? It, I, I mean, God answered prayer so marvelously here. Look at chapter 5, verse 20 and 22. I, wanna, I, I got to get to this right away. This is Deborah after the victory. She's singing the victory song. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. The river of Kishon swept them away. That ancient river, the river Kishon. Look at me up here. You know what happened? In the middle of the night, they began to pray, Oh God, you promised us the victory. Do it. They, didn't, they, they had no idea how God was going to do it. But the rains came. There was an outpour. There was a thunderstorm in the middle of the night. And all these 900 chariots, they'd already come down and parked around the river Kishon. I don't know whether they'd crossed it. I don't know what side they were on. But they were ready to fight the Israelites. And, and what, a, what a powerful looking army that was. Can you imagine the Israelites up there? They know Deborah's right there. Don't be afraid. I've heard from God. And they're saying, no, I hope you have. You had better have heard from God. Look at those 900 iron chairs. Look at those charioteers. Look at the swords. And you know that there wasn't even a weapon among all the 40,000 fighting men. There wasn't a weapon in Israel. They didn't have a weapon in their hands. Not a single weapon. Can you imagine going out against this army without a weapon? Where were we going to get the weapon? They're going to take them out of the hands of the enemy. The enemy had their weapons. They were going to take it right out of their hands. And in the middle of the night, the rain came down. Isn't that what God's, isn't that what revival is? The rain. Send the rain, Lord, send the rain. And they prayed down the rain. The river Kishon began to overflow its banks and turned the whole valley into a mud puddle, into a marsh. <laughs> the soldiers got up in the morning. To see her, the captain says, March! And you can hear the whips cracking and the wheels spin in the mud deeper, deeper, and deeper. And they can't move. And suddenly, Israel army, 10,000 men said, they can't move. Look at them. The chariots are stuck. I see, see, they, they were on high ground when the rain came. It's a good place to be. And, you, and, and the, they go down in that valley. And I mean, they hand wrestled that army. And they're climbing over those chariots. I mean, they had feared those things so long. Can you just see them like uh, everybody looking at those chariots and taking the axe of those people, the swords, and knocking off the wheels, cutting off the reins. They're so angry at those chariots. And they look and those chariots are muddy and filthy and dirty. And I'll bet there are 10,000 Israeli soldiers said, we were afraid of that. Is this what we've been afraid of for 20 years? Hunks of junk? And see, when God sends the rain in answer to prayer, He takes away the fear. He takes away the fear. And that's one thing about the revival that God wants to send. It's going to be a revival of holiness because when there's a revival of holiness, it's always accompanied with a hatred of sin. A hatred of sin, an anger against the devil, an anger of everything that Satan has taken. And it's, it, it's, it's a cry for holy dominion, not, not, not to establish some righteous uh, kingdom here on earth, but that the honor of God at stake, that his glory may be exalted on earth. Hallelujah. The Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts. Hallelujah. All right. I'm not going to preach long tonight, but I want to get to the heart of this just a few more minutes. I'm telling you now that when God begins to move on a people, when He begins to show that a spiritual awakening is about to dawn, when He begins to raise up a clear message against sin and against slavery, it's dangerous not to get involved. It's very, very dangerous. Now, I want to show you something very important now. Well... The praying band, this awakened band are praying and going forth to take dominion in the name of the Lord. There were a whole group in Israel who shut their ears, who refused to get involved. The first group, I'm going to name three groups. One of them was cursed. And if you've never, if you've ever listened to a prophetic word, listen to it now. Because it's everything to do with us tonight. First of all, the Reubenites refused to get involved. Look at chapter 5, verse 15, verse 16. This is Deborah. She's crying out, Why abodest, or why did you sit 
among the sheepfolds. This is Reuben. In fact, look at verse 15, the last part of it. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Let, let's, the, the whole verse 15. And the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the bleedings of the flock? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. You see that? Great thoughts, great searchings of heart. Do you know that the Reubenites are still with us? Do you know where they're at? They're at a convention, a how-to convention. They're having great thoughts on how to win the lost. They're in some great conference or seminar having their hearts searched out. Oh, how, they, they even go to meetings where they weep and, and they cry. We have failed God. We're not doing the job. I'll tell you where the Reubenites are at. Right now, they're in committee meeting. And they're drawing up resolutions. And they're drawing up strategy. They've got more paper plans than you can believe. They write all the books on how to. Very seldom do they do it, but they know how to. I, I had a writer friend who wrote one of the greatest books you've ever saw on door-to-door -door salesmanship. I said, I, don't, I didn't know you went door-to-door. -door. She said, I've never knocked on a door in my life. She, she wrote a bestseller. If I told you which one, she, she's here in New York. Bestseller on how to be a good door-to-door -door salesman. Never knocked on a door in her life. All the books on how to raise kids are written by people who don't have kids. The Rubenites. Resolutions. Strategy. You know, when we came to New York City, someone asked us, what's your strategy? You have a plan of attack. I don't want to be in any strategy meetings. I want to be on my knees. Here's the strategy right here. The, the, the Reubenites, they've got it all figured out. If 3.5 Christians witness the 6.2 in seven years, we'll win the world. They got it down to decimal points. But there's no action, no commitment. There's no dirty hands. There's no going up to the mountain to pray with Deborah. They're all out to some convention how music and praise will bring down the iron chariots. And I'm not making fun of that. I'm just saying it's going to take just more than people saying, you ought to come to our church with such good music, such good praise. I want to know how many people are bending their face before God, prostrate before the Lord, weeping for the lost. Now, Gilead, the scripture said, Asher and Dan were too busy. Look at verse 17. Gilead abode beyond Jordan. Why did Dan remain in the ships? Asher continued in the seashore and abode in his breaches. Look at that. They abode in their breaches. You know what that is? Their own little struggle. They had their own little breach they had to take care of. They stayed right there. I've got enough problems of my own. Why should I get involved? It's not my problem. I can't help it that so many are suffering. I've got my own problems. So they abode in their breaches. Others stayed on their ships. You know, they kept rowing their own little boat, not even concerned. No concern for anything other than their own family, their own needs. And the, the Danites, the Asherites, and the Gileites, they were all wrapped up in their own careers, making a living, taking care of their own business. The Bible, it, 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 she said they didn't show up. Why did, you Reubenites, you sit there listening to the bleeding of the sheep, and you have these great thoughts, these great searchings of heart, but where have you been? God is moving. And I'll tell you what, you know what the Reubenites do after the battle's all won? They're listing 16 reasons for posterity, how you can destroy the iron chariots. They're the ones who summarize it all up and try to tell us how to do it the next time. But you see, they remain. They didn't come. Now, I want, to, I want you to see something right now. The Bible says that the Reubenites didn't come. They weren't judged. They weren't cursed. Dan didn't come, Asher didn't come, they weren't cursed. But there's a curse mentioned here. I want you to look, chapter 5, verse 23. In fact, I was going to call this message the curse of Meroz. And I didn't think people would understand that. But the key to this whole thing is right here in this verse. Curse ye Meroz. 
said the angel of the Lord. This is a curse right out of heaven. The angel of the Lord spoke in God's behalf. God had a bitter controversy with these people. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Is that in your Bible? Curse these people, because they didn't come to the help of the Lord. Now look me in the eye. Please look this way. This curse of Meroz has everything to do with us. It's one of the most important, one of the most important scriptures in the Bible. Not the most, but one of the most important scriptures in the Bible. Because it clearly reveals God's attitude toward complacency. There are so many people say, well, Brother Dave, I'm just going to shut myself in with God. I'm just going to grow up by myself. And there's an attitude. I don't need all of this. And usually it's because you've been to a church where you've been dissatisfied. You didn't get what you wanted. And so there's a tendency to withdraw. To be a long range, and we've all been talking about that from this pulpit. But those days are over. God will not permit that anymore. Because He's sounding a trumpet call. He's rallying His people. And I'm not, I'm not trying to say, go out, go, go, go out in the street. We've had enough of that. I'm saying, come to the table of the Lord. Bend before a holy God. Let Him search you out. You don't sit in conventions and get searched out by one another. You're searched out by the Holy Ghost. And it's not a matter of great thoughts. It's a matter of humble thoughts. It's a matter of not trying to have something big for yourself or establish a ministry for yourself. It's to hear the heart of God, to weep as God weeps, to feel His heart so you can see out of His eyes. But look at this. Deborah is saying, The age of the Lord says, Curse Meros! Now, why is it that this particular people are cursed? Now, there's nothing in the Bible that clearly states why this was cursed. We can only surmise, and, and we know that Scripture answers Scripture. Isn't that true? If you want to know it, you, you look in the Scripture. You, you know why? Uh, if, if you look in Revelations, I'm going to close just a minute. Didn't God say, because you're neither hot or cold but lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth? That's about as big a curse as you can get. He said, curse Meroz. And you know why I believe Meroz was cursed? Because the inhabitants of Meroz were the closest to the battle. They lived there. And remember when Jesus said to Chorus and Bethsaida, if they'd seen the works that you've seen, they would have repented. Woe to you, woe to you. He cursed Bethsaida and Chorus because they had many miracles. I believe, that, I believe that they had received the message of Deborah and Barak, and they had mocked it, they had ridiculed it, they'd said, I don't want anything to do with it, there's nothing to me. They'd watch the iron chariots go, and it had nothing to do with them. They'd sneak their own way, do their own thing, totally unconcerned. Trust them. Because they didn't come to the help of the Lord. Now, I thought, I thought the gospel was how God helps us. And that about what you hear most of the time? God will help you, God will do this, God will do that. No, they didn't come to God's help. They didn't come to God's help. I want to tell you what. God uses men. He uses women. He uses people. And God's trying to save thousands in this city before judgment comes. There have been many, many people have the same vision I've had. It's a vision of standing. I'm on this 20, we're on the 22nd floor of a high-rise in our apartment. And I'm standing there in this vision. I'm looking out. And you've heard me tell it, perhaps. And I see that cloud of smoke in the distance. And I said, honey, look. It's a, it's, it's a hydrogen bomb. It must be Washington's being bombed. And there's another, it's Baltimore. And then a closer one, it's Philadelphia. I said, honey, we're next. And look at the people. They're, they're unconcerned. They're going to Central Park with their picnic basket. Everything. And I'm, I'm saying, honey, it's all over. And nobody's concerned. And suddenly it goes black and then bursting into the light of his glory. And many, many people have written to me saying, I've had that same vision. Destruction, there's no question destruction is coming. It's going to come in a time of great economic upheaval in America. The Russians are going to move, and I can prove from the Scripture, it's going to come down over the North Pole. There's going to be a rain of, of, of these missiles come from the North Pole. There's no question. It's in the Bible. You said it's a shocking thing to say. Well, uh, how, how many Scriptures it says that destruction is going to come suddenly? Look, look at, at uh, don't turn it out, but Revelation 17 and 18. They're going to be up in the ships, and in one hour, it's all going to be up in smoke. And, and, and we hear that, but we're unconcerned. We try to block it all out. But to the Christian, those who know better, those who've heard the trump trumpet sounding, those who've heard the call to go against the chariots of the devil, those who are called to prove that God's still at work in his church, 
to raise up a testimony of this mighty strong arm. I'm not talking about cleaning up Times Square. Bob made that clear this morning. We're not talking about driving all the pushers out of here. We're saying there's a testimony where people know that God's at work. Do you know that the state and federal government and all the whole city, our mayor and everybody, nobody can shut that 42nd Street down. They're powerless. Nobody in the city has been able to shut the smut down and the pornography and all the pushers out there. Nobody's been able to do it. You, you know the best that the United States government can do? Just say no. Yeah, you've got a tank rumbling down there. You say, no. Chariots are moving. No. Just say no. That's foolishness. And I'm not belittling Mrs. Reagan. But that's, that's, that's what we've come to. Our paper swords. That's not going to do it. And those who will not heed the call, those who won't bend their knee, those who won't make this commitment and come to the aid of the Lord because He does not work without human agency. There's never been a revival in history that God doesn't use praying men and women. I'll tell you something. Years ago, 1920, 1957, I was just a country preacher, and I began to seek God. I spent months on my face. And it was out of that prayer time that God mandated me to come to New York City, and out of it came a ministry. And none of you boys would be sitting here right now. Not one of you, probably. I doubt it. And all over the world. Because God broke my heart. And He's doing it again. And I don't care if anybody else comes with me. I'm praying that God will break all our pastors. I want Jimmy, and I want Gary, and I want Steve. I want all of our staff, those who sing, and everybody else, those who want to be a part of this body, to get the burden of the Lord, begin to seek His face, and come to church having the fire of God, having been on their knees, the cleansing, the, 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 the purging that comes by being shut in with God. And there's no other way. We, we might as well pack it in, because it's not going to be like it's been here anymore. It's not going to be like that here. Why? Because there's a commitment made. There's a commitment that's been made, and I'm asking God to do that in you. Not by hyping it up, but by the Holy Spirit right now, putting in your heart. I'm not going to let the devil run over my family anymore. I'm not going to give an inch to Satan. We're going to rise and pray and seek his face. First, we're going to claim an upper room where we can meet. We're going to meet right in Times Square. And this is not a pep rally for upper room. This is a challenge of the Word of God. There is going to come a curse. You know what that curse is? They, that, the whole thing is never heard of again. It just melts away. Reuben becomes as unstable as water, the Scripture says, and it just flows away. You never hear of Reuben again. And Bob made it clear. All of these tribes didn't come. In the book of Revelation, those tribes are not even mentioned. Isn't that correct, Bob? Those tribes aren't even mentioned. Will you stand up with me? I'm in a fighting mood against the devil. The wicked one come and have nothing in us. Oh, God, give us a people here that will get on their face. God, give us a people that will take... Uh, there's no other... You talk all you want about spiritual authority. It's not going to come any other way but through intercession. No other way. How many bear witness to what I'm preaching tonight? Raise your hand. All right, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask you to wake me up. I ask you to wake us all up. My Lord, help us. We've had enough preaching about what we're supposed to do. We've had enough seminars. We have enough teaching. It's time to pray. It's time to seek God. It's time to get the burden of the Lord. Hallelujah. This is the end of this tape. For a copy of this tape, or any other tape by David Wilkerson, write to World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindell, Texas, 75771, or call 
963-8626. Thank you.